Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Since it is the 1st of August, if you'll kindly look at your screen and wish everyone a happy birthday with a very special shout out to the members, Tina Mead's son on the 4th and Sugar Spite's niece on the 24th. I hope each and every last one of you enjoy your birthdays or the other birthdays that you have turned in. So, from my heart to yours, enjoy your birthday from Back to Ashes. If you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We would love to have you as part of the family. And then make sure you set your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. Also, if you are curious about how to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to tip me with a coffee, all the information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Camping Horror Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story and ad will play. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Okay, so every time I think about this story, my brain literally breaks. It was 2014. My girlfriend at the time and I were on an impromptu camping trip up in Northern California. I'm not quite exactly sure where, but we lived in Sacramento and drove about four or five hours up I-5. We were up in the hills and drove down some pretty sketchy roads. Once we found a spot, we parked our car and hiked maybe a half a mile in, truly in the middle of nowhere. We set up our tent and made a small fire pit about 25 yards away. The day was fine. We hung out and did camping things, and when it was time for us to go to bed, we put out the fire, got into the tent, zipped it up, and went to sleep. This is where it really gets weird. The girl woke me up in the middle of the night to tell me she's going to go find a place to pee, but she was struggling getting out of the tent. I can't find the zipper, she says. It's gone. So I get up to help, and as I feel around the walls, they're completely smooth. I grabbed the flashlight, and when I turned it on to investigate, we found out that the zipper was under us. All of our stuff was still in order as we left it, but we were sleeping on the door side of the tent. We roll the tent to get out, and when we finally do, we find that we were right next to the fire pit we built, 25 yards out. We were totally terrified and confused because there was no way we could have slept through both of us rolling in a tent that far with all of our stuff staying in its place. We stayed up till the sun came back up and left right away. I still have zero explanation as to what happened. I entertain some pretty out there thoughts, but this one is one that will sit with me forever as the strangest thing that has ever happened in my life when I have gone camping. This happened way back in 2013 when I was just a junior in college. It was our college organization's annual art camp. For a short description, we're all in fine arts departments and our organization holds this art camp where there are seminars from our professors and mentors and all in all, team building activities. It's usually set in recreational venues. As I've said earlier, I was in junior and it was our year as the officers of the said organization. So, we were the ones who chose the venue, planned the games, itineraries, and such. To give a brief description of the place, it's in a rural area around Laguna in the Philippines. It's a huge recreational area with hanging bridges leading to the campfire, pool area, and obstacle courses. 
In the middle of the venue, there's a huge open space function hall where the seminars are held. Our cabins are hidden by trees located far behind the hall. The first cabin was for the mentors and professors. The second was for the girls in my year and co-officers. The third was the sophomores and freshmen. The fourth was for the guys in my year and some freshmen. And the last two cabins were occupied by higher year students. On the right side of the function hall, there's an outdoor lounge area with a life-size chessboard game. If you walk straight further, there's the obstacle course area. Further from that was the pool and the forest ski area where the campfire and hanging bridge was located. This particular story was experienced by my classmates. It was already night, around 8 p.m. Our scheduled seminar was already finished and everyone was done with their dinner. Some of the students were chilling on the patio of their cabin. Some are walking around and us, the officers were busy with planning tomorrow's activities. The guys, we're gonna call them Gab, Wally, Kev, Allen, and Hero, were chatting and chilling inside their cabin. One of them decided to explore around. Hero told them to go and play at the chessboard area. They decided to go out, except for one. Gab approached Frank. He was a freshman. Dozing at the top bunk. He asked if he wanted to come with them, but Frank was sleepy and he said no to them, turning his back against them. Before leaving, Gab asked Frank if it's all right to borrow his slippers because he had none and Frank signaled okay. So the five guys were heading out of the cabin, fooling around and laughing. They looked around and saw students slowly heading to each cabin to rest. They were almost a few yards away from the chessboard when Gab noticed someone walking parallel to them. The guy was heading to the large old coconut tree adjacent to the chessboard area. He was confused and stopped walking. Wally, Kev, and Alan and Hero noticed the walking guy as well. It was already dark around with minimal light far from them. Gab tried to rub his eyes and recognize the walking guy. It was Frank. They all shouted, Frank, come here. Hero realized Frank stopped walking and turned to them. No expression at all. Alan was confused as well and asked if it was really Frank. Gab realized something creepy and face the guys. How could it be Frank when I'm wearing his only slippers? He mumbled nervously. They all looked at the guy they were calling earlier and noticed it continued walking and then suddenly disappeared behind the old tall coconut tree. The guys collectively gasped, run and shouted loudly back to their cabin. When they reached the door, Wally opened it only to find Frank was sleeping deeply with his headphones on. They woke him up, slapped him softly, and asked him if he's okay or if he went walking outside. Frank rubbed his eyes open, saying no, very confused. The five guys got scared so much they tried to outrun each other, heading to our cabin, telling us what happened. I was so scared but not actually surprised since I felt creepy around the area during the nighttime. It felt really strange and off. I've had my experience the night before, but I was not sure if it was paranormal. I was the only one awake at that time. It was 2 a.m. and I hear giggling around our cabin, like kids running around chasing each other. I also noticed silhouettes walking past our screen door, though I personally tried to dismiss it and think of it as some sort of the students were still awake, fooling around outside ordeal. But I wasn't able to sleep until at least 5 a.m. I believe that place has ghosts and elements in it, as per the recount of some of the students as well. You can easily tell if there's something creepy in a place just by the feel it gives off.
Here's a couple scary experiences that I had when I went camping. I have had two camping and hiking experiences that I consider very scary. The first was when hiking the West Highland Way in Scotland. After a hard day's hiking, I realized I wouldn't reach my campsite before nightfall. Rather than stopping and pitching my tent for the night, I decided to continue on in the dark. All was going well. The path was easy to follow by moonlight. Then, I got a very strange feeling. I couldn't put my finger on it. Something was there. Something was watching me. As I scrambled in my backpack for my torch, I turned and was confronted by a pair of eyes reflecting the moonlight. These eyes were at an equal level to mine, so something six foot tall was looking at me. I was shaking as my hand found my torch, and I quickly turned it on and aimed the beam at the eyes. In an instant, my heart rate dropped back down to normal. The eyes belonged to a sheep who was standing on a large rock, making it appear larger than it actually was. My second incident occurred whilst hiking the Appalachian Trail in the U.S. I had started my hike early in the year, actually too early, and I was battling cold and snow. I had spent the morning hiking up the mountain following the flashes indicating the path. Those mountains seemed to never end, and hour after hour, I was ascending until I finally reached the summit. I stopped, cooked a lunch, and took a few pictures of the stunning views. I then decided to start my downward descent, but I couldn't see a flash. Where was the path? There was a number of unmarked paths heading through the undergrowth, and I decided to follow one. This path went about half a mile before suddenly ending at a sheer drop-off. I decided to take a few more pictures when I heard twigs break behind me. I assumed it was another lost hiker and didn't pay much attention. Then I heard grunting, which wasn't normal hiker sounds. I turned to find a bear standing on his hind legs around six foot tall for me. I then realized I must have disturbed him as he was waking from hibernation and I had just cooked and was carrying food. I must have smelt like a walking takeaway buffet. He charged at the exact same time as I stepped back over the edge of the sheer drop. As I started to fall, I felt his claw strike my leg. I fell about 30 feet, landing into a heap, impact apart from pain, in my ankle and a big gash on my calf. And somewhere nearby was a bear. I could see a road in the distance amongst the trees and had no option but to head in that direction. I finally reached the road in a clearing just as it started snowing again and realized I could go no further. I pitched my tent and climbed inside. Early the next morning, I heard something outside and with trepidation, poked my head outside expecting to meet my furry foe. I was, however, confronted by someone walking their dog. After greetings were exchanged, he pointed out a sign that I had missed the previous day. It was a park ranger's announcement that bears were active in the area. The dog walker then gave me a lift into town where I could get my ankle and calf treated. I had fractured my ankle, which unfortunately ended my hike. I still to this day have a nice claw-shaped scar along my calf. A few years ago, I was hiking and camping in the woods in northern New Hampshire when I ran across what looked like an abandoned house. I love finding places just like this to explore, so I obviously was very curious about the house's contents. There was a pathway to the house made of stones that had been covered with weeds and various other vegetation. 
The house was surrounded by overgrown grass and tree limbs that had fallen, making it difficult to get to the porch. The front porch was small and made of bricks that had a layer of moss grown all over it. It was obvious that no one had been there in years. The front door was intact and locked from the inside. I didn't see any broken windows that I could fit through, and the windows on the front of the house were covered in a thick layer or dust and dirt, so I couldn't see anything. I checked if the windows were open, but I suppose the wood had warped and swelled, so none of them would open. I gave up on getting inside the house and settled for walking around the back side of it to explore the grounds around the house instead. When I made my way to the back side of the house, I found a window that was a bit less dirty and was able to peek inside. I couldn't see much. What I did see was an area rug and what looked like a small table beside the window. I decided to check the back door on the off chance that it would be open and I could find out what exactly was in this mysterious house. Lo and behold, the back door was locked as well. But when I gave it a slight push, I could feel the frame was loose and weak. It didn't take much force to push the door open, breaking the frame. Yes, I know this is considered breaking and entering, but as I said above, it was obvious no one has been there in many years, and I have a fascination with such places. I couldn't just walk away without knowing what was inside. What I saw once inside completely took my breath away. I was standing in a kitchen complete with dirty dishes in the sink, a drain board with old cups and glasses turned upside down from being washed but covered in a very thick layer of dust. There was a small kitchen table with drinking glasses on it, newspapers that dated back to June of 1959. The cabinets were stocked with dishes, and there was a tall pantry that contained various jars of preserves and fruits and veggies that had obviously been canned by hand. Everything was covered in dust. I continued to walk through the house, and I found each room I entered to be completely furnished and covered in dust and dirt. There were spider webs throughout the entire house, as well as signs of rodent activity. There was dresser drawers with clothes that had been chewed and nested in by what I assumed were mice. In the closet hung clothes that had begun to deteriorate and had holes from insects. Upon further inspection of a child's dress that I found, it seemed that the clothes were handmade. There were two bedrooms, one of which was obviously a room for children, with two twin beds that were perfectly made up. The bedding was in very poor condition, but seemed to be hand-stitched also. Same thing in the other room, only it contained just one larger bed rather than two. The cabinet in the bathroom had a few toiletries, a straight-edge razor, as well as towels that were neatly folded, but now had become nests for small animals. At this point, I was very creeped out and began feeling as if I was being watched. I decided it was time to leave this strange house that appeared to be stuck in dime. As I walked through the short hallway that led back into the living room area, I decided to see what kind of pictures were hanging on the walls, I wiped some of the dust off of the pictures hanging near the doorway of what appeared to be the parents' bedroom and discovered it was a photo of a wedding. The photo was very faded and appeared to have some type of mildew growing behind the glass. I decided to take a moment to check out a few more pictures in the frames that hung throughout the home. Most were scenery or various still-life objects. I found another photo hanging in the living room near the front door. This one was of the entire family. It was in worse condition than the previous photo, but I could clearly make out a man, a woman holding what appeared to be a very small infant, and two children sitting on the floor at their feet. I found this very odd, as 
I hadn't seen any signs of an infant anywhere in the home. I don't know what could have possibly become of this family that lived in the house. Did they leave for work and school and never make it back home? Did they decide to take off and leave all their worldly possessions behind? Why? What happened to the infant in the family photo? To this day, I have many questions that I have no clue how to find answers to. I stumbled upon a home that day, not a house. That was a family's home that they lived in, experienced a life in, and mysteriously disappeared from. I've never been back and never intend to. Just thinking about that place creeps me out. It was as if this family had no clue they never returned to their home that day. They last walked out of the front door, and it was apparent that no one had come back to look for them. So... There you have it. I found a family's home hidden deep in the woods of northern New Hampshire. I honestly can't believe I'd forgotten about this. This happened back in the fall of 2002 or 2003, when I was around 12 or 13 years old near Clinton Lake in Kansas on a Boy Scout campout. I still go backpacking and camping a lot, but this was the last camping trip I remember attending before moving states. We arrived at our campsite on a Friday and planned on staying through Saturday and leaving Sunday morning. I remember us having to set our tents up in the rain Friday evening, but Saturday was sunny and gorgeous. I don't remember every precise detail, but right before we went out to hike that morning, an old van, perhaps a late 70s model, pulled into a campsite within view of ours. These guys were hippies with a capital H, and that was my first exposure to what weed smells like when some of us asked if a skunk was nearby. They were too far away for us to hear any specific conversations, but even the adult leaders found this to be a funny sight. One of the leaders, I think, went over there to ask that they stop using drugs in front of us or to move campsites. When we got back from our day hike, those hippies were still at the same campsite and baked. They couldn't play their instruments with any skill. Here's where it got weird, though. By the time the sun was setting, the group of stoners had completely ditched their hippie attire and had dressed in a total goth style. Some had makeup that made their faces unnaturally pale. Others had black trench coats on, and they must have had a stereo because all we could hear over there was grunge metal playing. That night, after we cooked and ate dinner, all the scouts, including myself, headed out into an open area of the campground to play capture the flag. We collectively established the boundaries, which were still pretty close to the group of our now goths, but it gave us a different angle of view to their sight. I doubt they had any idea we were there, since we played with no flashlights. By this point, the grunge metal had been replaced by this creepy, ominous opera music. I succumbed to curiosity, but I wasn't about to sneak into their campsite. I just crept a little closer to see what they were doing. They had made a large campfire beyond legal limits, and I couldn't see any of the group. On a tree, I saw something that had me initially freaked out, but... I figured that they were feeling the weed and any other drugs they may have taken. For this to be real, and continue to play. I think we only played one game, then retired to our tents. At some point in the middle of the night, all of our adult leaders woke us up and told us to quickly and quietly pack up our things, take down our tents, and get back to the bus. As we were packing everything up, we couldn't help but notice the bonfire was still going strong. But the music had stopped and we heard people talking. 
The tone didn't sound like casual conversation either, but I couldn't hear specific words. I don't know how to describe it. Once everyone and everything was back on the bus, the driver got us the hell out of there. The adults were abnormally quiet, and the scouts had congregated to the back of the bus. I don't remember if one of us told the adults about those guys, but we knew it had to have been regarding that strange group. A fellow scout from the other CTF team had also tried sneaking into their campsite and saw the same thing I did. Ever since, I'm inclined to think what we saw was real and a reason for us cutting the trip short. Hanging from that tree, he and I saw a decapitated dog and two severed human legs. I never learned anything more about that night. Hey y'all, this took place in the summer of 2022 and I just never thought of writing down the story because I was so stunned that it happened to me. So, every summer in my city, me and my friends like to make small campfires and chill, secluded areas because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay any campsite fee to do so. These also happen pretty spontaneously, so it's a nice last minute hangout to do. There's this one spot near my house that's located by a river that's really nice because no one usually goes there. The only thing to be worried about are bears, though, because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that, and my house specifically is located right next to mountains and forests. So, one particular night at 11 p.m., I decide to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set things up early because I want us to be chilling once they all got there. The spot I get to has a two-minute paved walkway I have to go through, and then I have to take a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway is two lamps located at halfway and another at the start of the bridge and the ramp down to the campfire spot. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and bring my campfire stuff like flashlight, lighter, small firewood, small shovel to dig out the pit, etc. I get to the spot and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small waiting area for toddlers with their families during the hot summers. So I set up the chair and I get to digging the pit with only my flashlight illuminating where I'm digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, nowhere near the water. But all of a sudden, I hear a loud splash, a splash so loud that it can only come from something equally large like a two-handed sized rock. I'm confused because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water, even though I'm only a few feet away. I shine my flashlight at the water, and I don't see anything. So, I kind of just brush it off thinking, I'm just hearing things. But, as I keep shoveling a little bit more, I hear another loud splash. At this point, I think something is falling from above, because logically, something must be falling into the water. I point the flashlight above, where some trees are above the river, and I don't see anything big enough to make the splash. So, I keep digging, with my heart rate kind of going up at this point. I hear a rustling past the arch of where the bridge goes over the river. I quickly grab my light and shine it towards where I heard the rustling. I call out, Hello? No response. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately, but there was no signs of a bear, or signs of anything for that matter. So, I tell myself I'm just hearing things now because I've seen horror movies before and now my mind is playing tricks on me in the dark. But, I hear the noise yet again, and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled. So, I shine my flashlight over to the area again, 
and as I focus my eyes towards the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress because, honestly, of all the things I was to see, I didn't think I'd see the naked back of a man. From the quick analysis my brain could muster up, he looked to be mid-forties, shaved, not bald, and medium-ish built, like a mix between chubby and built. As I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up, and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start packing up all of my shit and getting the hell out of there because now I'm piecing in my head that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare or shoo me away. So, after using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceeded to speed walk out of there with all of my stuff. I'm carrying all of my things with me and briskly walk up the small ramp and I'm on the paved path now out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest and I am frequently looking back to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm in Crocs, mind you, so I'm hoping that if I have to book it out of there, I'd regret not being in sport mode from the get-go. If you know, you know. I make it to the halfway point, and I have a sense of relief that starts settling in, knowing I made it safely out of this very scary situation. But, as I check behind me for the final time, I see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours, as if he was primate walking. His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way. To the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly gets up from his stance and starts standing on his feet and positions his body to face me. After setting himself into his new position, the man starts running towards me. I freaking book it. I run as hard as I can down the path. My flashlight jumped out of my pocket and I lost it, but I didn't care because a whole naked-ass man was chasing me at 11 p.m. at night in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second, and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I care. I wanted to make it out of this situation alive. I finally make it out of the forest, and I run to my car, which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get into my car, and like a classic horror movie, I fumble with trying to get my key fob to unlock my car. I actually drop my keys and quickly think to myself, I'm actually dead. But I brush the thought off and pick them back up. I get my fob properly, unlock my doors, and throw my things into the back seat before getting into my car. This felt like an eternity. But in hindsight, most likely took six seconds altogether. As I try to guide my key into the ignition, I am fixated on the end of that paved path that I was just at a few seconds ago, waiting to see if the naked man was coming still. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch my sights onto the road in front of me, and I zoom out of the area as fast as possible. As I drove away, and I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place, I get a call on my phone. It was my friends calling me asking if I made it to the spot yet, and all I say to them is, Guys, do I have a crazy ass story to tell you? They pull up to my house because again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area, and I tell them the whole story, the way that I told it just now. They swear that it was none of them trying to prank me or anything like that, and I also knew none of them would try to full sprint at me with their dong out. But as we're just talking out in front of my house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going towards the direction of where I encountered the naked man. I just yelled out to him, Hey, yo, be careful. 
There's a naked guy that was chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. He responds saying, Oh, damn, really? I got to go over that bridge to go home. All I tell him is, Good luck, man. The next day, I reported it to the police by phone, but they sent over an officer so I could tell them in person and show them where in the area I saw these things. When we went to see where I initially saw the man's back hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously, but the officer said that they would make note of it anyways in case it happens again. Some friends say it's a skinwalker, others say more realistically it's either a homeless or mentally ill or drunk or high person. One theory I've heard my friends say is that it's a future version of me pulling a prank on past version of me. Because honestly, if, and I don't know when, time travel is real, I would totally screw with my younger self like that. So, that is the only crazy story I have. But damn, it is a story I will never forget. Years ago, when my husband was working for a sports equipment shop, he belonged to an angling club. Once a month in summer, we would camp out for the weekend with our three girls. We would leave on a Friday afternoon, returning late on the Sunday. Our three little ones loved these weekends, roughing it and sleeping in a tent or the back of our station wagon. One particular Saturday, I set up to serve a cold lunch. We had all eaten, and my husband had already returned to the rod by the water, about 50 yards away. The girls were helping me tidy up when the eldest, about 10 years old at the time, I think, asked if she could eat the remains of a can of spaghetti and tomato sauce. I replied in the affirmative and carried on with my cleaning up. A shrill scream from behind me brought me to a halt, turning I was met with a heart-stopping sight. Our daughter had blood streaming down her hand. She had dug a spoon into the bottom of the can where the sauce and spaghetti wasn't as liquid. The can had slipped right through her grasp, cutting her at the sharp edge with a vertical lid. I clamped my hand down over her wrist, almost dragging her over to the open back flap of the wagon where our canister of fresh water was. I held her hand under it and opened the tap. As the force of the water hit the wound, I could see how deep the cut was. I screamed for my husband. Hearing the panic in my voice, Hubby double-timed it back to us. He took one look and started throwing all of our stuff into the back of the station wagon. This was more than a band-aid could fix. We made space for the injured child to lie down, the other sitting precariously on top of the chucked-in camping gear. I sat twisted around in the front seat, holding her hand up and staunching the flow of blood. I know we broke all speed regulations on the road back to our town and our doctor. We were extremely fortunate as we screeched to a halt in front of the doctor's house. He was sitting on the front veranda with his mom and a lady friend. After a hasty explanation, he quickly followed us to his consulting rooms. It took the four of us adults to hold that child down while the doctor injected her in her thumb. He explained he couldn't just sew her up live. As soon as the anesthetic started working, I had to excuse myself. I sat on my haunches back against the wall in the passage outside the door. The adrenaline rush was over and I thought I was going to pass out. Forty-odd years later, and our daughter still has the scar. The reminder of the worst thing I ever saw while camping. Early in our marriage, long before we had children, my husband and I would go camping during our vacations. We loved the outdoors. 
On this occasion, we set up our tent next to a trout stream where he fly fished every spring. On the edge of a state forest, it was beautiful and remote. Very few people camped there because it was primitive, having no amenities save a dirt road and some fire rings. Only fly fishermen liked the spot. It was the middle of the week and no one else was there. I would hike and he would tie flies during the daylight, but at night he would fish. The trout rose to feed late at night. So, my husband usually went out at about 10 or 11 p.m. and returned about 2 a.m. I would stay at the campsite, tend the fire, turn up the lantern, and read. This is what I was doing when a young man walked into the light of our camp. He looked to be in his late 20s with a scruffy beard, wearing a baseball cap, t-shirt, shorts, and trainers. He was not dressed for camping. No hiking boots, backpack, water jug, etc. No flashlight. He just looked out of place. He startled me as I had not heard a vehicle or any other noise approaching. He said hello, looked around, and I offered him a camp chair to sit by the fire. I asked if he was a fisherman, but he said no, he had been visiting friends nearby. Strangely, he did not sit down, but started wandering around our campsite, looking at the car, the folding table set up with our various equipment, and even into our tent. He was talking non-stop all the while about what a nice night it was, asking me all sorts of questions about why I was there, who I was with, etc. I became increasingly alarmed because he kept angling behind me. I got up from my chair and also started moving, not letting him get behind me, carrying on the strange conversation all the while telling him that my husband would return any moment. This was not true. He wasn't expected back for at least a couple more hours. Meanwhile, I started planning to defend myself, looking for a piece of wood to use as a club, wondering how far away my husband was and if anyone could hear me if I screamed. I knew the river well, where it drops, shallow parts, and clay ledges were. So, I thought maybe I would just jump into there, or possibly run down the hiking trail, and disappear into the woods. I tried to keep a good distance between us, but if I moved, he moved. I mentally prepared to fight tooth and nail. Meanwhile, I was screaming inside my head at my husband. Where are you? Come back, I'm in danger, come back now! This weird cat and mouse game probably went on for only a little while, but seemed like forever. The fellow started talking about being in the military and serving in Southeast Asia. The rushing water, all the crickets, peepers, and other night noises were causing him to flash back. Teetering on the edge of panic, I heard that whoosh whoosh noise of my husband's waders as he walked up the trail, approaching our campsite. Thank you, God. Almost hysterically grateful and relieved, I ran towards him, saying loudly, uh, Look, honey, we have unexpected company. He appeared confused, and when I turned to gesture at the stranger, he was gone, completely disappeared. As my husband moved his waders and vest and unloaded his fishing gear, I described my strange encounter. We immediately scouted the area, but found no trace of the young man. We walked some distance up the road, but saw no lights or any sign of a car. We returned uneasily to our campsite. My husband explained why he had cut his fishing short. He had experienced a really creepy, unsettling feeling while casting in the stream. Here he was, engaging in his favorite sport in his favorite spot, and for the first time, he was actually frightened. Then, a beaver suddenly jumped off the bank into the water, 
right next to him with a big splash, scaring the hell out of him and practically making him fall over. He didn't know why, but he felt like he had to get the hell out of there right away. And so he did. Some might say that nothing happened and it was all of my imagination, but why did that guy take off the minute my husband approached? No, we believe that he had bad intentions. After that, I would never be alone at a campsite or in the woods again. I accompanied my husband while he fished, sitting on the bank, slapping at the mosquitoes, or else we brought a friend or two along so I would have company by the fire, but camping was never the same idyllic experience. I've been backpacking and camping, mostly solo as an adult for the majority of my life. I'm cautious about my surroundings, and I listen carefully when I'm out. I try to remain an observer and move through the land with little impact. I'm also very interested in the mysterious and obscure, cryptids, alternate realities, and the unexplained. I've read most of the missing 411 cases. I think college is experiencing some confirmation bias and am a serious devoutee of true crime. All of the morbid and curious things I can find. Anything scary that will fire the imagination. There have been occasions where I felt slightly uncomfortable, or watched even, when I've been out in the woods, but mostly I've chalked it up to being alone and alert. Maybe my inherent skepticism makes me less susceptible to encounters, which others experience. I look for logical conclusions first. I have never encountered an truly off or deranged people out in the forests, but I do consider that the biggest threat is the human animal. A few years ago, I set out to camp near an old growth forest in North Georgia. Most old growth here is gone, but there are places that haven't been logged, and if you get the chance to visit one, wherever you may live, I would highly suggest it. It's beautiful, serene and alive in a way that's hard to describe. This particular forest was one of hemlock and popular, and the trees were massive. I had a guidebook that gave directions out into the sticks following little country roads that eventually turned into gravel. After a long drive into a national forest, I parked near the trail, which was unmaintained, meaning it wasn't very popular or highly traveled. I hiked through the woods to where the trail eventually just kind of stopped. There was very little undergrowth. I spent the afternoon just exploring, looking at the trees and enjoying the calm. I eventually made my way down to a creek and crossed over it to an old field that formed a sort of bowl in the land with hills and ridges on all sides. The fact that there was a field means that there had, I guess, at one point, been people living in that area, but I saw nothing of the sort when I was there and my map showed that I should have been far from any roads or settlements. I set up my tent and made some food. It was late when I decided to have a little smoke and lay out in the field in front of my tent and look at the stars before bed. There was little to no light pollution, and I always relished the opportunity to enjoy the sky at times like those. As I was laying there, I began hearing a loud knocking sound from up near the ridge where I'd been earlier in the day, maybe a thousand yards away. Three knocks and a long pause, followed by three more, and then it would repeat. When I say knocks, what I mean is a very loud noise, like two logs or trees being hit together loud enough to reverberate in the little bowl I was in, loud enough you could almost feel it. 
I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but it was night in the forest, and anyone who's been out there knows it's really dark. I thought it had been a person making the noise, because what else would make such a rhythmic sound? It was extremely loud and would have taken considerable effort to produce. I've seen no one else at all during the day, and the direction from which the sound came was the section of old growth I had explored earlier. And that's it. Eventually, the sound stopped, and I went to bed, feeling like I had heard something I was not supposed to hear. Or maybe that I had heard something specifically meant for me and me alone to hear. I packed up and hiked out the next day. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hyper aware at waiting for something else to happen, but nothing did. I told my friends about this, and they'll either say it was for sure a Sasquatch or that I was for sure close to somebody's house that I didn't know about, but why would a person be out in the woods late at night, banging logs together in the dark. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true camping horror stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Cindy Cleveland, Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Christy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mee, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, and Sugared Spite. Thank you all for remaining the pillars upon which Back to Ashes stands. And to the subscribers and just anyone who is listening, thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to me and it means a lot to for the channel, for without you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these selections. Until next time, please take care of yourself and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.